Welcome to the Smart Driving Cars podcast. We appreciate you spending some time with us. This edition is sponsored by the Smart ETFs, Smart Transportation and Technology ETF, symbol MOTO. For more information, head to MOTOETF.com. I'm Fred Fishkin, along with the Faculty Chair of Autonomous Vehicle Engineering at Princeton University, Alan Kornhauser. Hi again, Alan. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Fred. And with us this week is the founder and CEO of Local Motors, Jay Rogers. Thanks for joining us, Jay. Good morning, Fred. Thanks so much. Jay, great having you. Thanks, Let- Alan. Pleased to be here with you. Let's first of all tell the audience uh, a bit about Local Motors. You've been around a while and really a pioneer in building autonomous shuttles using 3D printing. So we've really pioneered uh, digital manufacturing of vehicles. Uh, The founding story of the company was really not based on autonomy, but as much based on new technology in vehicles. And I think we've seen whether you count as processors or whether you count as discrete new systems, Uh, vehicle portfolios have really surged forward in their technical capability in the last uh, two decades. And so we see it in EVs, we'll see it in ADAS systems, in full AVs, human machine interface, and so many other things. And so we really brought a digital manufacturing focus on this future of vehicles, because we think the way vehicles are made today by companies like Tesla and companies like Ford are just made too slowly. And it takes too many billions of dollars and too much time to bring new models to market. And I guess you're, you're best known for the vehicle named Ollie. Tell, tell us a little bit about that for folks who haven't seen it. Ollie is a low speed self driving shuttle. It is a connected, autonomous, level four self driving system. It carries about 10 people. And uh, Ollie is deployed in about nine places around the world right now. And uh, um, it, is a, uh, um, it is a vision of the future for first mile and last mile transportation. It's a connected vehicle that takes people around autonomously. We've had a chance to sit in one in Princeton at the at yes. Allen's uh, summit. Uh, not this year, but last year, I think it was. Yeah. Well, well, we'll 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 do it virtually this year, I guess, and uh, in October and and um, early next year, maybe we'll be all back in business and could do it can do it live. <laughs> well, you have some news coming out today, Jay. Uh, some big news for the company, I think. Uh, a new partnership with Mobility as a Service Provider, Beep. Tell us about this. That's correct. And so for us, Beep is represents uh, part of the new future that is uh, is just coming down the tracks very quickly. Um, Beep is a operator, um, a relatively new operator, the likes of which we had hoped to see come around the corner and now has. It's an excellent management team, uh, and they have gone over, gone after the markets where carrying people around autonomously at low speed um, have really much been needed. And so uh, we're excited to partner with them on a number of new initiatives. And uh, um, we're starting our work looking at Florida right now. And, uh, um, and we're just pleased to be involved. They have taken uh, a really strong uh, position on uh, the autonomous future. And this will be using the, the Ali vehicles? It will be. It'll be using our OLLI 2.0 model. I believe we had a 1.0 uh, when we displayed at Princeton, and OLLI 2.0 is, is significantly upgraded from uh, um, those first versions of vehicles. Tell us what this is going to mean in terms of the, the speed of deployment and how fast you're hoping to expand the marketplace. Well, for us, uh, all deployments um, are what I would consider micro multinational deployments because the world has evolved um, uh, very quickly internationally around autonomy. So you see deployments in Japan and Korea and Singapore and Luxembourg and Belgium and Sweden and Denmark and the United States and Canada and China. And so um, the technology is an internet click away for people to find out about. Um, But in the United States, uh, we would like to have a leading position as a country. Uh, We have struggled with certain laws being able to get low speed vehicles on the road. And so there are a number of us that have spent a lot of time on Capitol Hill. So one of the first things that this will mean is that BEEP and LM will work together with legislators and regulators in the United States to improve the pace of getting what I call new or non homologated vehicles on the road. Um, Separately, we will deploy these vehicles in areas which are approved and um, thereby showing the public that autonomy is real. 
And um, so a lot of new things are going on right now. We'll do so in numbers where people can actually utilize the system for what it's intended. Uh, and that will um, improve safety on the road. It will improve uh, um, reliable uh, transportation for people who might not otherwise have had it in those areas, so accessibility. And uh, um, it will show the world that autonomy starts first in low speed um, before you're solving all the problems of transportation. Um, so different pockets of autonomy, and this is one of the places where we think it'll show off very well. So these are some of the things that will that'll happen with the partnership. Well, um, Jay, I know the, you know, one of the places that we've struggled here to try to get all this started is, is to provide mobility in communities and, and really just local mobility in communities. Uh, the good news in, in, the, in those communities is that um, the streets where, where we've contemplated, uh, uh, that we've contemplated using to provide that mobility, uh, mostly tend to be um, uh, low speed streets, 25 miles an hour or less. They're communities, of course they are. In fact, you know, th that should be the speed. Most unfortunately, and in, in this is essentially each one of these things, we end up maybe having to cross a, a state road or, or a, a, a U.S. highway whose speed is 35 miles an hour, 40 miles an hour. And then all of a sudden the traffic engineers come in and say, oh, no, you can't do that. And all of a sudden and everything goes south. And it is really, really unfortunate. And I don't know if, if the opportunity is, is to get the federal government to say, no, I mean, look, we have pedestrians crossing US 206, half a block from where I live. Uh, you know, we could have um, an Ollie shuttle uh, crossing 206, even though 206 there's, I guess it's only 30 miles an hour, um, but should be able to do that. But my goodness, you know, the, the county traffic engineer like goes nuts, the whatever. Ever, uh, you know, oh, we can't do that. But uh, do, and, and it is just so so disconcerting, and it's tip, it, it is really unfortunate because of course you know we're I and I'm sure you think where this can can serve a great deal of value is to provide mobility for communities and especially mobility for what we call the mobility disadvantaged those that, that haven't for whatever reason. Uh, been able to drive either they don't have a car or there's you know there there's a husband and wife in a family but there's only one car what the husband has to stay in the kitchen all day and be whatever because the wife has a car uh, never mind you, <laughs> I think you know where I'm going with that one um, I think it's a shame so anything you can do to sort of help that because because I think these communities would love to have mobility the opportunity to do it on local streets that should be slow, that of course have bicycles and pedestrians and all these shuttles, they can coexist uh, to provide mobility and, and really improve the quality of life of, of communities. Not Manhattan, but you know, um, Trenton, Princeton, you know, Lawrenceville, uh, what are the, all the other local communities, even Mountain View. Well, you've, you've put your finger on precisely the issue. This is the rub, if you will. Um, and so uh, I'll just to talk about it a little bit because it's something that most of the listening public, even the well-educated uh, um, listening public about this subject miss. There's a lot of discussion about getting autonomous vehicles on the road. And to many of the uninitiated, what that means is you apply for a license put an autonomy system on a currently available highway sedan or car. So if you look at this, Waymo has been doing this with Chrysler in many places. They'll put it on a Fiat Chrysler minivan or their recent announcement is they'll put it on a commercial vehicle or other things like that. And John Kraftick will talk about the fact that we're here to build a better driver. That's great. That's Waymo's role. But who's there to build a better vehicle? When you have a connected autonomous shared electrified vehicle, the vehicle actually needs to be prepared to be autonomous. And so, and as many people do know, the expense of making a current highway car fully autonomous is huge. It's enormous. So it puts it out of the realm of a consumer buying that car. So now immediately the way to monetize a vehicle like that is either just make it non-monetized, which means it's it burning a hole in the pocketbook of someone, or what you're doing is you're making it a constantly utilized vehicle that's picking up lots of people. But a sedan is not well optimized to do that. 
So we have a problem. We need new vehicles. And Alan, you've just said it. We have vehicles like Ollie, which can do the job right now. It can ca- cross Route 27, Route 206, all the routes you want to do. And the, the legislators, this is no fault of the regulators, have not been able in the United States to put these vehicles on the road. And why? Because we don't have a classification for these vehicles. And the regulators cannot exempt the weight classification of the vehicles. So their hands are in the air and say, help us change the law. Now in Europe, you can do it. There is a low speed, heavyweight classification. And uh, this may all sound very boring, but you put your finger on it, Alan. And I think that the world needs to know that the US is behind from a legal perspective. So all of the autonomous deployments in the world that you can shake a stick at, the US is behind. Because what we're doing is we're putting, we're band-aiding it. We're putting autonomy systems on sedans who quite honestly are not well optimized to do any of the jobs that we have. Even the cargo vehicles that are out there, they're not well optimized for placement of sensors or other things like that. And to do the job of connected shared electrified autonomy, we need the new vehicles out. So Europe will be first, Japan and Singapore will be next or are already there. And the US is, will lag behind. And we'll talk about good deployments that we're doing, but shame on us as a body politic. It's the people that push their legislators to make the difference and we're not doing it. So the regulators aren't behind, they're working with what they have. And uh, we need to make the laws change in the US. Well, a couple of things. You, for, you didn't mention China. Who knows what the heck they're doing, but whatever. Uh, that's a whole well, other one. Happy to, happy but, to but, talk but about no, it. No, no. <laughs> but but let, let's, working not, working. Let, let's not go there. I've, I've stated on a number for a while now. I consider these things a new mode. They deserve to have their own classification. Airplanes have their classifications. Choo-choos have their classification. Pipelines have their classifications. Cars have their classifications. Motorcycles have their classifications in a sense, although not not their their administration. Okay, this is this is this is different. Sure, it utilizes the road. Okay, the roads, why? So that in fact, hey, we built them, we paid, they're essentially paid for, let's jump in and use them. We don't need, let's not go and, hey, if we had a ton of money, sure, but but we don't. But the vehicles are, they deserve, they have, they have all kinds of different intelligence, all kinds of different designs, all kinds of different, even, even customers and so on and and whether that customer is is a package or it's a it's a person it it really deserves its own mode it, it deserves its own modal administration it, it deserves its own regulations focused on that as opposed to a bunch of asterisks that say you know um after we had 82 games per year instead of 22 games per year you get you know, home run, you know, whatever, and all that, right. <laughs> all the yeah. asterisks that we have on all other. What do you think about that? Or is that is that just, I mean, that's a hill too tough to climb and, and we shouldn't even go there. I mean, well, it's a, that's a really good point. Uh, a lot of people don't know that the budget for, um, so underneath DOT, we have things like uh, the Federal Aviation Administration, and then we have the National Highway Transportation Safety Administration. I think what you'll find is that the budget for NHTSA, National Highway Transportation Safety Administration, is one-tenth the size of the FAA. Um, and, and why? Because it's complicated to run planes. Why? Because uh, a lot of people move in them and they need a different kind of administration where there is a zero defect mentality. We don't have a zero defect mentality in vehicles on the road. In these roads you talk about, which are our roads, we, have a, um, it, we kill 34,000 people a year. And we do maybe it. More, nine, yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe maybe more. And yeah, we certainly whatever, injure yeah, many count, more. Yeah, yeah. And nine, 94% of them, as you've covered on this podcast and other items like that, are literally human engendered. So we have a far from zero defect mentality. And so, and then the roads. The roads are, as you said, maybe paid for. They're not because you know we we haven't raised, we haven't indexed the road tax to yep. things other than you know uh, gasoline. And so the problem there is that the gas tax doesn't cover the increased population that's out there. And so the cost of the road that is out there um, needs, it needs, we need to do things about it. Population's been exponential, so we need to carry people around exponentially. And uh, um, Uber and Lyft have helped to some degree. And now we need to start taking more people around inside of cities and we need to stop doing it in extremely heavy vehicles that carry one or two people around, even in an Uber and Lyft ride. And so um, this is what, this is the responsible thing to do with our roads. And I'd like to add to it that 
you will inevitably run across people. And I think, let me just add that operators like Beep understand this, and that's why it's great to have them as a partner. But you will inevitably find other Luddites out there, and I'll call them Luddites because it's the perfect example that say, well, when this is perfectly safe, then we'll deploy it on the roads. How can you say that? It's pernicious to say that because when people, kids die of people distracted driving, either getting hit by a car or otherwise, um, how can you defend that as being safe? It's not even close to safe. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, I, 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 I now say that, you know, the 94% of what is, is, is caused by human misbehavior. It's it people, maybe not intentionally, but when you take one too many or when you do, when you gaze off or when you go scratch your butt or whatever the heck whatever. you do that you go boom, you know, you weren't behaving the way you were supposed to be behaving according to the uh, driving manual that da da do da da da. And so uh, in a sense, look, we, we've got to put, we've, we have the opportunity to put technology around us that will protect us when we somehow reach our failure point and, and do that. And we should of course go there immediately. And we should of course allow these vehicles to be there for exactly the same reason you have. And, and we can't wait to go to zero. I mean, not, uh, you're perfect and Fred's perfect. I know I'm not perfect. I mean, you know, if, if it's perfection, then I don't know. I'm playing golf. I don't know. I mean, that, that's too much for me. Uh, but, uh, but we can certainly improve on the system and make it available to so many more and so much more affordably and, and really improve quality of life, quality of the environment, quality of everything. And we need, need to get on with it, right? Happily, I think it is happening. Um, I could be Pollyanna or I could be optimistic and I could yeah. say, you know, you got to go slow to go fast and, and we're doing it. And like I said, the regulators at NHTSA are working hard within where they are. So I'm grateful for the deployments that we do have. And, um, and I think that we are seeing more deployments on public roads now. They're not everywhere. So the, the body politic knows because you'll cross somebody on the street in America and they'll say, what do you do? And I'll say, well, I make autonomous shuttles that carry people around. They said, well, I, I heard that autonomy was a long way out. And if you listen to Elon Musk or you listen to other people, you hear all these roadblocks. You hear things like, well, you know, LIDAR is useless and, um, you know, wait for the visual cameras to catch up. You can buy my $3,000 autonomy upgrade and you'll be fully autonomous. But then it doesn't happen. And, uh, um, and, the, and so the public knows that it's not out there everywhere. And it could be. It could be in first and last mile locations everywhere. And so um, I can't scream that enough. Beep can't scream it enough. And we all want to educate the public. So it's time, it's here. Um, I started this company uh, 10 years, a little over 10 years ago. And my son at that time, my oldest son was uh, 15, almost 16. Um, and, uh, and now he just got his driver's license. And so um, I'm frustrated because I've had 10 years to get autonomous vehicles on the road. And I'm not going to wait another 10. Um, Jay, and Jay so up, until now, up until now, uh, with the deployments you've had, there have been uh, safety monitors or, or people on board? Absolutely. So we have what's called stewards. The way I think about it is it's just like the way elevators came to the fore. You had an operator that said going up, going down, and they would run a wheel that would adjust to get to the floor and open the gate and let you off. Today, that's a whimsy. And, uh, and we, so we have operators that are on board that uh, are there to explain that it's self-driving and to help in situations where you, where you can cross a public road. This is the other thing that I think needs to be called out is we could easily have someone take over a joystick and be a human if we wanted to put a human in the loop to cross a public road, if you will. So even that is there with these stewards that are on board. But obviously, um, for those that work on hard determinism and soft determinism and humans in the loop and the theory of robotics, um, I think putting a human in command of a vehicle, uh, I have even personally seen it, is something that can cause more accidents again, because the human is taking all of the autonomous systems offline and then putting it back in a system where it is. And that is complicated, more complicated. But we do have a steward on board for safety, so to speak or so, for transitional safety. So, um, Jay, the, the tough question, okay, the, the, the difficult question, that, and the, the question that, 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 um, 
that of course I, I have no capability of answering. The premise is, or at least the premise I put out there, is to really get to affordability. You really need to be able to take the steward out of there, just like the steward came out of the elevator. I always use the same elevator analogy that, that you mentioned. You know, I, what did it take? Apparently, it, it was an elevator operator strike in New York or something like that in 1945 or something like that that sort of broke it all open that, that really allowed the entry of the automated system that, in fact, has made, um, has made tall buildings affordable. I mean, tall buildings would not be affordable if you had to have elevator operators in each elevator for stewardship or whatever ship and pay them a living wage, um, you know, 24 seven. I mean, uh, uh, very few uh, tall buildings could, uh, could meet their bottom line or at least the way they're operated now. I sort of think this is the same thing with this technology. What would it take for you to this as CEO of Local Motors to say, boom, we're going to take them out of there. We're going to go this next, this next step to really make this affordable so that we can then have tall buildings, or mobility. We can really break this thing open. Well, one what, of the first what does things. that take? It takes an insurance company that's willing to let you do it because if your vehicles aren't insured, you can't get them on the road. And okay, we could so, debate that. So that's the first one. Yeah. So, so that. Mike Scrudato of, of Munich Reese says, hey, he's willing to do that. He does. Uh, at least, and, uh, I, I think have, he, I, I'm, I'm speaking for him. I shouldn't speak for him. But we, if he doesn't, Swiss Re is going to do it. Another one's going to do it. Okay? Well, we have Allianz. Is a, we have Allianz. Yeah, yeah Allianz will provider, do it. Yeah. Okay. Allianz has been great with autonomy. So the yeah, first thing it yeah. took was getting auto autonomous insurance, which would be willing to do it. And that's done. That was my point. It's that's yeah, finished. Okay, okay. Okay. Great. So the next thing that you have is that you need to be able to get the operator and the local municipality to say, okay, we can take the steward out. And that's really what it is. Cause we, as a company stand by the vehicles, we are the first line of defense on it. So if we say yes, it's just an ominous, ominous, we're taking the steward out. Then what we have to do is the people for whom we operate the vehicle have to say yes, for our area where you take people around because it's usually the, the operational different. design domain, right. you know, right. Correct. The ODD. Yeah. And yeah. so beep, yeah. beep in this case would need to say, we are happy to take out the vehicle. And then you would yeah, need because the let me authority. Let me just jump in. The ODD is a well-defined thing. It's in the code. The vehicle's not going to go out of the ODD. It's only going to operate on that. Right. Uh, those things are all well-defined. They're all programmable. The, 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 the municipal officials can look at it and whatever, and they say, Hey, no, we don't want this or we want that. They can put that in the code and, and it's done, right? There's no, there's no monkeying around with that, right? That's right. And yeah, then I mean, that's I straightforward. Is, then what I would also say is it takes, um, uh, these are sort of the things that people don't want to hear. It takes enough vehicles in the network so that people have a great experience. So sure. um, we have lots of things that need to be ironed out and discovered. So the, the issues of people who get on an autonomous vehicle when they haven't paid. Um, we have the issues of an autonomous vehicle that gets stuck in a situation which was unheralded. It's an edge case. And so, and it'll stop safely yeah. and stay. But the bottom line is that um, you, these things are all, they could be worked out in a six month period. Sure. And you send a tow the, truck out. You sure, know, you send I mean, a tow truck out, you do now, other things right? like that. I mean, so, sure. But when we are asked to deploy one vehicle as a test, there's no, as a CEO, I'm not going to put an entire ecosystem of people to deploy and help no, no, one no, vehicle. No, 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 of so, course not. Of course not. So, yeah. so here you ask the question, yeah, yeah, here's yeah. what we would need. Yeah. We need an operator to say, okay. We need the local regulators to say, okay. We have an insurance company that's already willing to insure it. And we need a deployment of a size that would allow us to be able to run a great service, which would mean anything that happens during that time, then we're done. And that's it. And these are not hard things to do. They're not. Um, but also we need a federal legislation that says you can put these vehicles, forget the autonomy part, again, back to the before, it's the non-homologated vehicles that are carrying the low speed heavyweight shuttles that are carrying people around. We need a classification in the US. In the Europe, that will be done by this. It's already done and will be on the public roads by the end of this year in Europe, fully homologated. And I think that will put pressure on the US because people who travel or look will simply say, why can this be done in, the, in Europe and why is it not done in the United States?
Well, let, let's make that happen in the in the U.S. legislature. They've got to do something down down something down there in the swamp, don't they? I mean, I thought the swamp was supposed to have been uh, cleaned up and whatever. Well, any do you have, do you have any thoughts about how long? Stay away from take that. <laughs> I think that the I think that the legislation will take two years. I think that you've got um, GM working toward this with their origin and cruise team. You've got Neuro working toward this. You've got us working toward it. You'll have other people that are out there. Um, and so the autonomy companies, the pure autonomy companies like AutoX and other things like that, they'll be out there pushing. Um, but they're really just pushing for their autonomy systems. They don't really care so much. They, they're they very happy to go on a Toyota Highlander or a Chevy Bolt. They don't care as long as they can prove their autonomy systems. So it's up to those of us that make vehicles that have to do it. And we are actively in the halls of Congress trying to get this done. And we're basically told it's a, it's a two-year endeavor. So uh, one other one other question that I have is, um, as as the news over the past few weeks has come out, it, it looks like maybe um, stuff may may benefit from driverless mobility before uh, some of us benefit from driverless mobility. The uh, mm -hmm. of course the Amazon Zooks and and what Waymo announced uh, a couple of days ago, and and um, and uh, and of course some of the discussions that we've had on here have to do with if, if you if you really look at, at at stuff moving it's it's to to me the important piece of it is is moving to my front door okay why because 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 it involves me and serves me of course that that's what i'd be and 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 i've sort of put out there maybe flippantly or maybe too flippantly that basically these roads that we have between 1 a.m and 5 a.m are unused and I realize that I want something from Amazon in 15 minutes sure right okay but but probably 50% of the stuff that I get you know if it if it's if it's on my porch the next morning I'm like the happiest camper in the world right. and, and so and so the opportunity to go in there and really test this stuff on our community streets in our neighborhoods without the children out there without the bicyclists out there without the other you know in 1 a.m to 5 a.m i don't know that middle of the night when it's essentially unused when it's a heck of a lot easier to really get this stuff and do it without the driver so that in fact you know you have the opportunity to display this um, in, a, in a much less risky environment, contribute to both knowledge and bottom line and everything else. Is, 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 that, a, is that a place to really go now? I mean, yeah, I, I, believe, I believe you've also hit on a very ripe area and COVID has shown it to us. We basically got to see the nighttime and the daytime during COVID because everybody had to stay in inside and you're like, oh, this is what it looks like at midnight to 5 a.m. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. so, I mean, I live in San Francisco and when I look out my window in downtown, it was like nighttime during COVID, it still is. And yeah. so um, this is, and I thought, think to myself, wow, what an underutilized asset that's sitting out there. No one walks, everyone's trained, don't cross the street. So, I mean, now you have an empty street and you have an opportunity to take things around. But do I think a Ram ProMaster van is the way to do it? No, I no, think but, that we've already maybe seen- maybe you can design yeah. something. Sure, I mean, look I, what Amazon has done. Now, interestingly enough, Amazon has stated, I think that their purchase of Zooks is for the movement of carrying people around as yeah, much as uh, it is for good. Who and believes so, what they, yeah, whatever. I don't know, I, don't know. I, I think yeah, that- okay. Okay, sure. I, I, th I think that the what we have here is an opportunity to learn about new vehicles yeah, that yeah. are autonomous and doing a new job. And you listed, if it's on my porch, what a wonderful problem to solve. How do I get it on your porch? I don't oh, want to, I don't, I don't need a virus carrier to do it. So, I mean, and that's a human. And so if I'm going to get rid of a driver, the neuro has a good idea, which is yeah. let's start figuring out how I train people or have other devices to just simply drop it on the curb or do whatever it is that needs to solve that problem. Or Solve have a problem. have a locker on the on the block that the community. Should, I, I I'm sure there are a lot of people who can go in there and be very creative with with the last fifty feet. I think. Correct. And we I keep think. being told we keep being told like the U.S. has the economy, which is the soul of creativity and other things like that, and that's true. But you can't let necessity be the mother of invention until you can actually get to the last fifty feet. Right. Um, if Absolutely. you're not at the last fifty feet, then you never solve the problem. Absolutely. Yeah. 
So Jay, you were talking about uh, the, the COVID-19, uh, and I was going to be asking you about the impact on ride sharing, et cetera, but you, it's had a pretty personal impact on you. <laughs> Tell us right. about it. Well, I've had it. And so I think not a lot of people, not enough people talk about it because uh, we're all going to get it or we're going to get a vaccine. But I think those are the only two choices because I don't think with our economy, we can stay inside for the next 10 years, making sure that we keep this virus at bay. And so, um, and we've just seen in the last three weeks, four weeks, recent examples of opening up and with opening up come more virus infections. And so, but you don't hear enough about the people that get over it. So um, in early May, I got sick, got it. Um, and uh, took me about 15 days to get over it. And, uh, um, you know, I didn't have prior existing conditions, the likes of which you read about. Uh, so I stayed in place. It was hard for me to get uh, in to see a doctor. I did a virtual visit. I was just told to stay in place and uh, not go anywhere. And so uh, quarantine worked for me. Uh, and um, I had most of all the symptoms that were out there. Uh, didn't lose my sense of taste. Um, and uh, watched videos of other people that had had it in quarantine in place, read blogs about, you know, how can you make yourself feel more comfortable when you, you know, are uh, having trouble breathing or doing other things like that and monitoring yourself. But for me personally, I wish I had had a pulse oximeter so that the little doohickey that goes on your hand, interestingly enough, the inventor of it recently, Japanese fellow just died and uh, not of COVID. And, uh, um, and so uh, um, if I had had that, I really would have felt totally prepared to shelter in place at home. I'm healthy. Um, I had uh, um, a network of doctors who I could have called. I could have called an ambulance to go to the emergency room. And if I had just been able to tell my oxygen level, I would have felt safe personally at home. I'm not a doctor. I'm not prescribing things for other people, but that was my experience and uh, um, didn't end up going to the hospital and uh, um, got over it. I think I've been more sick at other times. Like I had the measles when I was younger and I remember being much more sick when I was, uh, when I had that disease. So, um, you know, had it and I'm over it. And so now the question is moving forward. I do not think that we have the, the type of community in the world, though it's been tried in certain places to go for herd immunity where more people get it and we accept the losses that come from COVID. Um, but uh, come hell or high water, we're getting it or getting a vaccine. And uh, if more people would talk about their experience with COVID, I think that that might, might make people feel a little less uh, frightened about it. What are your thoughts about the, the impact on, on ride sharing? Uh, we've, uh, we've been taking a, lo a look at this and hearing about some new research too when it comes to, to transit and people being willing to get on an ollie, for instance. These days. I, I look, the way I think about it, and I may be very strange in this way, is John Rockefeller was busy, busy, busy during the Great Depression, running around, buying up refining capacity and selling it to Cornelius Vanderbilt on his you know, rail lines when people didn't need that much oil. And, uh, and people thought, you know, the economy will never come back. You know, this will be unnecessary, all those kinds of things. And uh, I see the same thing. People say, well, will we ever ride vehicles again? COVID will be gone. It's a pandemic that we're here right now and people will um, make some changes, but I think that we'll still need transportation. We need to get around. Um, there have been great studies that have been done about the value of telecommuting and working from home. And I think we have seen some increases. And then there also have been great studies that have been done that show over time, our ability to be productive drops when we have been working in a, a Zoom conference environment or whatever you choose at Microsoft Teams. So I think there's pretty good longitudinal data right now that says people will move, they need to get around. And we don't have the road system for everybody to have their own vehicle. We don't have even close to the regulatory environment or legislative environment to, to put other forms of decongesting the road. So something's got to happen. And so I think autonomous shared electrified mobility can be cheaper. It can get people around. When we're through the pandemic, we'll see people ride. And on the way there, we've been able to offer things like uh, um, uh, the ability to put a clean ollie out. This is something people have, off, have, have asked for, and so we've been in the process of getting it together, which is things that would allow you to feel safer, like going in a building um, or other items like that, that says that this vehicle at least is aware that there's a pandemic. And so if you're wearing a mask, it has its mask on, so to speak. And uh, um, I think that that could be a stopgap until we get through the pandemic. 
and uh, um, and that's that's what I think about shared mobility. I think we'll see do you, it again. Do you think you could automate some kind of uh, sanitizing system? I think you absolutely can automate it. I think the question is always: every time you introduce a new human, you have the opportunity to have you know a uh, the transmission of the virus, and so you're just constantly engaging um, you know uh, risk, and you're just basically saying how can I limit the risk here? And uh, so you can put copper powder in materials that makes it antiviral, and you can um, have ionizers, and you can do UVC lights when people are not on the vehicle, and you can um, have fresh air intake with a HEPA filter and you can do all of these things, dividers between people who sit on a vehicle and they all help. And so I think what most people in the population are looking for is not a hermetic environment, but something which is um, better than what they had before. Yeah, I, I think I think with that, um, w one of the unfortunate pieces of this is that we've ended up calling this uh, social distancing instead of physical distancing. Uh, when when we get out of this, it will be easy for us to not physically distance. The problem is, is that we've been we're putting into people's head this concept of social distancing, that in fact you know keeps them wants to keep them apart socially, as opposed to 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 physically, and I think that the socially distancing concept in people's brains may end up you know lasting substantially longer it would be tremendously unfortunate if that's in fact what we've done just because of what we've called this darn thing i mean you know really what we're trying to accomplish is is for for physical separation in, during this pandemic so that we don't spread it we certainly don't want people to say oh i don't want to be anywhere close to you uh you know because of social the, the social aspect of it and and uh, anyway my, that's, my, that's my, just my, a minor little thing but damn I it that bothers me it, it might be my my eight-year-old son uh, had a, a new neighbor that moved in next door and uh um and basically he's a, a five-year-old kid and he comes over every day to play knocks on the door and says is social distancing over so that i can play and he doesn't know what social distancing is, and I think he will not care and forget okay, about it by the time it's done. Good, that's good. That's that's yes, good. Yes. I hope I hope those those of us that are older sort of get over it too, and and sort of say, hey, you know, we can hug again at least. I mean, I don't know or whatever, or not yeah. be afraid to get in the vehicle because there's another person in there, and have, heaven forbid they have a different colored skin than us. I mean, oh my, holy hell! I mean, that's just yeah whatever and yeah, we should tell Maybe. listeners alan too that uh, you get into some of the issues about the fear of public transit in the latest smart driving car newsletter yeah looking at some of the research from carlos pardo at the uh, new urban mobility alliance which was founded by robin chase so yeah we, so we, we encourage we, people to look at that yeah, yeah we we I've tried to put in this latest issue they'll go out later today uh, you know some some things that people can read on this to, to to sort of look at this, I, I of course agree with Jay. You know, you only have two choices here: either we get a shot or whatever, or or we get it. You know, I mean, that's the only way you get to herd immunity. I mean, you know, it doesn't. We've all it's known that's the only that's way we it. get the economy going. Yeah, yeah. yeah, and 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 we've 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 all known that's almost since the beginning, uh, which was the frustrating thing of of this whole darn thing, because you know, there's that's the only thing that stops it. Um, and um, and um, uh, hopefully uh, we're getting close. Looks like the government is spending a lot of money. Apparently, Pfizer and some other folks are claiming that they're going to be able to put on the table, you know, scale ver uh, outputs of these things, uh, millions of doses, maybe by December. Who knows? But we have 320 million people here, just in the U.S. of A. So if there are only 100 million of them. Or that means one out of the three of us gets it. I'm ahead of you, Jay. No, <laughs> no, you already had it. You don't need I'm it. Not need it. Yeah. I, I guess. Oh, but but we don't know that because we don't know how long. What the, I don't know what mutations. <laughs> yeah, well, and, uh, and there's the, there are the global issues to contend yeah. with. And there are who, and there are seven billion people so. on the planet. Right. What the hell do we do with the seven billion? I mean, you know, uh, that's a lot more than a hundred million doses. Seven billion. 
We'll continue in just a moment, but this is a good time to remind you about our sponsor, the Smart ETFs, Smart Transportation and Technology ETF, symbol MOTO. To get more information, head to MOTOETF.com. When you get to the website, it's a good idea to read the white paper there. It's titled The Smart Transportation Revolution under the Insights and News tab. Some great information there to help you make informed decisions. You may know that ETFs can be a smart way to spread risk with investments and focus on a particular category. Once again, the site is MOTOETF.com. Let's get to some of the other headlines in the Smart Driving Car newsletter. We've touched on some already, Alan. Waymo and, and uh, Fiat Chrysler have announced a new strategic partnership for the development and testing of autonomous light commercial vehicles for movement of goods. It's a pretty big announcement, Alan. Yeah, I, you know, I'm a, a week or so after Amazooks or whatever we're calling it, um, uh, you know, Amazon Zooks. Um, yeah. <laughs> And so now is it going to be them versus the two of them battling it out? I guess, as I put in the, in the newsletter, the only, the only difference between Amazon, Zooks, and, um, and Rivian, let's throw Rivian in there because I guess the, you know, the vehicles looks like it, it might be Rivian. Um, Amazon has a customer. Um, Waymo and, um, and Fiat Chrysler, uh, who's the customer? Is it going to be a postal service, UPS, FedEx, Walmart, Macy, <laughs> Sear? <laughs> um, you know, but the, you need it. You need there. It's a three-legged stool here with this. The, the, the to me the real the real power of the Amazon Zooks Rivian thing is is that. They can do that for their, Amazon can do that for its own bottom line. They're taking it, as I said, an expense out of their balance sheet that they have the opportunity to reduce, to go to zero, which is kind of the fundamental of their whole business, which is free shipping. And allows the cost of that free shipping to maybe go to free, which means whatever they're eating now to provide that so that we consume it goes to the bottom line. Whoa. How big of a motivator is that? Whereas, you know, Waymo and, and Fiat Chrysler, they're still out there. They don't have that. They, they need a customer. They need a customer that, we're, that that's spending a heck of a lot of money moving stuff to our front doors or whatever. They could all of a sudden have the opportunity to do that much more affordably and drop that to the bottom line, which then means you have the cash to do, I don't know, I mean, Jay, is that too simplified of an analysis, or is that is that just is that um, I don't know? It just seems to me that Amazon has. Um, it's what we've been it's it's what we've been talking about, and I think that sometimes the listening public can get can get lost in the difficulties of these things. A new vehicle architecture like Rivian uh, is an electric truck. Um, yep. That doesn't mean that the truck has been designed to be a great delivery truck. So there's still a lot of heavy lifting to do to design a vehicle that can do what you talked about between 12 and 5 in the morning. Mm -hmm. A ProMaster van isn't designed for that. So when you go back to the drawing board and you ask a vehicle maker, Rivian included, to go design a vehicle for a new purpose that fundamentally do things, it's billions of dollars and it's five to seven years. And so you have the right idea, which is... If you have a customer, design the whole system. So get autonomy, get the payments infrastructure, get the all of the you know the the customer uh, human machine interface, so to speak, to work, and get them the vehicle that will do that. So Amazon is on the right way of doing it. Waymo is just an autonomy provider, and Chrysler is just a vehicle provider. So not only do they need the customer, they need the the network that will do it. And so Amazon is the customer and the network and other things. So they're they're a fair bit ahead. Um, you're relying on everyone that buys a ProMaster van to use it in the same way. And that's a far cry from the fact that Amazon, as a customer, is using it always in the same way. So they still need Rivian to focus on a delivery vehicle, not just an electric truck. And Rivian doesn't have the money to do that. It doesn't matter how much they've raised. They've got to raise more money if they're going to do it. But and Amazon so, has it. <laughs> but the customer has it, right? The customer has it. And so and, we need to and see. And they'll drive them there. It. It'll yeah. make them it'll go there. Them to, it'll drive them to invest. It, and that's that needs to happen. Tesla in the news again, Alan, of course, <laughs> reporting this uh, profit 
of $104 million, surprising a lot of people again last quarter in the middle of a pandemic. Uh, and they're picking Austin as the site for a new gigafactory to build their cyber truck. I guess all you can say is hats off or? <laughs> hats off. Well, actually, I'd like to engage on that one for a okay. second. Okay, all this, right, good, good, please. This notion of a gigafactory, you know, that bigger is better to me is laughable. Um, a gigafactory makes sense with batteries. Um, a battery is something that should be mass produced. Um, and uh, it's discretized, it can be modularized, it can do a lot of other things, but mass production of batteries makes a lot of sense. Mass production of vehicles impugns recyclability, it stuffs more products on the road in a way that we don't need them, and so you've got to solve that problem. And so this, this marketing shtick of a gigafactory to make something, I mean, if you look at the Model 3, the goal to make 300,000 of vehicles that are exactly the same, we have now just put 300,000 a year new Model 3 on the road that are not and cannot be autonomous and they're not shared they're not meant to be shared so we've now stuffed our roads with more vehicles that is a problem we have to solve so mass production was given to us by henry ford and frederick taylor and the the internet heralded the day when it came out to change the way we make things and um digital instructions going to machines is the future um tesla has not been able to do it the brick that they created in the middle of the factory, which was this sort of automated brick to make vehicles by robots, is not something that is, that's taking mass production and putting robots in charge of mass production. And they even proved to themselves that it became so complicated to operate the middle of the factory that they had to remove robotics from their gigafactory for the Tesla Model 3. So um, we need to start thinking differently about the way we make things, stop having the tooling intensity of the way in which we make vehicles, buying hundreds of millions of dollars of stamping tools and forming tools to make a cyber truck exactly the same every time it comes off the line. And this is an incredibly important thing to think about. You know, I went to Princeton, studied mechanical and aerospace engineering, and was told by Enoch Durbin, don't get in that business because it's not a game where you will, it's, it's old school engineering. And he was right. The way we make vehicles today is old school engineering. We need to use the power of the internet and digital instructions to be able to make and recycle and upgrade vehicles on a yearly basis. And gigafactories can't do it. They weren't made to do it. Sounds like you need to have a talk with Elon. <laughs> I mean, I'm happy to have a talk with Elon. I'm just busy building it for ourselves. And so I think that the point here is, and there are other, this was not my idea. Um, uh, a professor, Peter Wells from Cardiff University and another professor, Paul Nunhuis from uh, INSEAD came up with the idea back in the late, uh, um, uh, uh, at the turn of the millennia, so to speak, in the 1990s and said, with an internet, it should be possible to move manufacturing closer to the consumer and that will help recyclability and it will help upgrade cycles. And now they couldn't have imagined a pandemic, but boy, our global supply chain, great, build a gigafactory in Austin. How's that gonna help the people in China that need to get the vehicles? You gotta pick them up and ship them someplace. And so we're not solving that problem. We have, we're going into a trade cold war with China. And so you're not helping the 7 billion people of the world by building more mass factories in one place and expecting to ship across borders. And you're certainly not helping the recyclability of those materials and cars degrade at a non-linear rate for the parts that are there. So basically you have a battery that could last longer than a chassis or a chassis or a body or structure that could last longer than the electronics. And so if you look at GM's focus on the cruise origin vehicle, they've said, we're gonna make a vehicle that can work for 14 years and a million miles. Imagine having an iPhone for 14 years and a million miles. It would be the oldest iPhone in the world. And so, I mean, I think all, it, 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 that would mean that you would have kept your 2007 original iPhone one and you still wouldn't have been able to get rid of it this year. And so it's silly to think that we want in this day and age to have a vehicle that lasts for a million miles in 14 years. Henry Ford would be happy. Actually, I don't even know if Ford would be happy. He might, as a tinkerer and somebody that was always looking for the future, he may say, what a crazy and silly notion. But we have to change that. So gigafactories stand in the way of it. And we're not interested. I'm not interested in convincing Elon Musk. He'll either get it or not, but we're off doing it. <laughs> Jay, that's why it's great having you on. <laughs> I love it. I love it. And um, love Enoch, too. Yeah. The California DMV, Alan, has given the okay for Auto X to test an autonomous car without a driver behind the wheel. This is within, I guess, just a designated area around at San Jose headquarters. 
Yeah, well, I mean, Another it, step, it, I suppose. It, it is a step because because they're only the third entity that California has given such a uh, such a license to, um, and so in, in the end, uh, you know, you, one has to pull the driver out of there. One, I, to me, testing is not the issue. You, there are so few of them out there for testing. Why not have the person out there? That, to me, I mean, you might as well. I, if I don't know, if I was Jay Rogers, I would put the person in there. What's it going to cost me? Uh, just. You know, let them oversee it. I don't need that. The issue is at scale. When you're actually providing the service out there, the reason to me why you want the driverless is to make it affordable, to get the cost down so that the price can come down without having your hand out there for alms for the poor. Okay, that's the key. And, and it seems to me, as I look at these fundamentally, that one of the big cost elements is, is the chauffeur. We're willing to do it for ourselves for free. We've enslaved ourselves to drive ourselves around for free. I won't drive my neighbor around for free. Hell, he better pay me. Okay. Right. Amazing. All right. That's, you know, that's a really yeah. good insight. You know, that's a great insight. It's a great insight to see, Alan, because the we have enslaved ourselves to do a job where we take hours a day in most cases, even when you live in a local neighborhood, where you give up your amazing brain to focus on something and God help hope you focus on it because you're, driving, you. around, <laughs> you're driving around an incredibly, you know, large amount of, you are creating a large amount of inertia. And so the bottom line is you better pay attention, but boy, what an underutilized use for that human. And so let's stop enslaving ourselves to doing yeah. those things. Yeah. So I've, Auto X is, by the way, I just want to note, great company, uh, Princeton founded uh, yeah. in part, and yeah. uh, I've driven around their headquarters. It's a residential area around their headquarters. I, I hope, I hope everyone knows that. And so, and they've been driving that same street again and again and again. So if they don't have it ready by now, um, shame on shame on everybody. And so, and in fact, they've trained the whole people that live near them because these vehicles are running around and they say, you know, Auto X, I think they're in Ford Fusions or they were yeah. in some sort of vehicle yeah. like that. So you can't see it from the head on um, because it looks like a Ford Fusion. But once it's closer to you, you know, it's an Auto X vehicle and it's driving around, it's autonomous. Um, yeah. You know, if I lived in that neighborhood, I'd feel very comfortable about them driving around without a human. I'd want to bring friends over and point it out. I think it's an amazing thing, but it's really not. It's just another step. Um, put it in, take it out. Um, we, we need to get new vehicles on the road, and that's still a Ford Fusion. Yeah, but, but when, when we have the new vehicles on there, I think that and, and with it, when you want to get it to scale so that, so that it can f provide this af high quality, affordable mobility. What's high quality? It's from where I want to go to where, where I am to where I want to go when I want to go within the operational design domain, of course. Uh, that could be small or large, but we start in whatever. And to do that and to do that for normal folks, I get, and even, you know, lower than normal folks for people that, you know, that really uh, can't, can't afford it any other way and, and let them have the, the, the benefit of the mobility, the opportunity to, to go get their hair done, to go to the library, to, to, to do whatever, to just visit a friend. I mean, you know, that's the value to me. That's, that's, that's where the value is. And to get there, I think, I think we need to make it affordable. Otherwise, we have to go to Washington, alms for the poor, alms for, and then they give us a, you know, a transit budget that is whatever. And then we can run a bus, you know, three times a week between, you know, never mind. Right. Well, affordability, and let's talk about that for people just for a moment here, I think, is that if I told you you're going to buy a Toyota Corolla, would you like the autonomous option from Waymo? And you say, oh, that sounds great. I can hit the George Jetson button. It'll drive itself. And then they say, oh, and that'll be $500,000. So now you've bought a $17,000 vehicle for, for $517,000. That is unaffordable. And so, and that is exactly what it costs to, to get your um, silicon and to get your sensors and to get all of the things that you need in order to be able to run an autonomous vehicle. And so it's unaffordable until you start putting it in shared vehicles. And that's just a fact. 
And so we can run them in all of the Chevy Bolts we want, but they are hugely expensive gold bricks driving around. And so this is something which will take time to come down. And it, but it's here today. So if you want to make a, a dial ride is also expensive. If I am in a wheelchair and I want to get across New York City, it costs 120 bucks yeah. a mile to, yeah. do, you know, 80 to 120 bucks a mile to run dial ride. And so yeah. the, the, it's already expensive. Let's put the shared vehicles that are already expensive with the autonomy systems first and make them safer and more available at all hours of the day. I, I, I absolutely agree with you. The other problem with if I own one of these things, guess what? It sits parked up most of the day. Nobody, nobody else because, because, hey, I'm sitting around here. It sits and waits for me. Why isn't it out there providing mobility for others? Why isn't it doing more than just sitting around waiting for me? And in fact, um, you know, I don't have my own elevator. I, people don't tend to have their own elevators. The elevators are in the infrastructure that you're in, in the system that you're trying to, to be efficient, to be used by everyone. Why don't we have horizontal things that 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 Hamilton Jewelers can pay for it can contribute to to bring me to Hamilton Jewelers to buy stuff for my wife I mean why don't you, when, and, your, when that, why don't you and your why don't you and your friend group buy an ollie and then there you can de uh, select and deselect people who want to pay for it so it's just your friends who use that vehicle I mean we have social networks now yeah. that would allow you to share there are many ways to share vehicles that don't just have to be with the with everyone under the sun i mean you choose yeah. it but just yeah. share it you 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 could you could do, do use it to share or an operator might put it out there and just make it available for you so that what the they hell will. why, why yeah. won't i go out there and use it oh it's i don't know it's it's the new, new jersey medallion. transit oh it's, no it's, it's i, the, I it's can't the new, be it's, it's a new medallion it's a new <laughs> it's, a new, it's who knows? I don't know. <laughs> Finally, from the newsletter, Alan, uh, Ford yep. and Mobileye are expanding their partnership. Uh, they're going to be using camera-based detection capabilities, and they're using it in advanced driver assistance systems. Uh, so that indicates that these are vehicles existing now. Yeah, sure. I mean, it's uh, what we've been calling safe driving cars. Absolutely. The vehicles that we own now, the more things that we can put in there that basically protect us, uh, for whenever we're misbehaving and, and basically get, give us a get out of jail free card or keep us between the rock and a hard place so that we don't, we don't uh, uh, cause carnage out there. Absolutely, all that stuff should be out there. It, it should be out there instantaneously. Uh, we probably should have things that keep us from speeding. I mean, I know Volvo came out and said once that they were going to keep vehicles under, I don't know, 102 miles an hour. I mean, come on. I mean, you know, really in Jersey, I mean, uh, you know, and, well, well, I think one of the bad things about the pandemic, I mean, you go out there on, on the interstates and there are a bunch of crazies out there. I mean, I'm doing, I'm doing 75 on I-295 and cars are going by I me. Mean, I, I think I'm on the Autobahn, you know, and they're, they're the, the Ferraris going by me, and these and these things aren't Ferraris; they're like Chevys and stuff. I mean, they've yeah, never there, there have been reports fast. about fatality rates. Uh, yeah, I mean, we've models. seen that. We've we've seen the, the the rate per vehicle miles travel. The fatalities has gone up, and and you can see it by just it's the distribution of speed that's the problem. If everybody went the same speed, maybe it wouldn't be such a problem. But once you get the distribution, and once you get the tail tails always get you you know it's a tail it's the people out there on the far end and i don't know whatever tails create the headlines yeah and before we wrap up we want to remind you to check out the replay video or audio of this week's driving the debate on amazon zooks and beyond uh, the site is driving the debate.com uh, keep an eye out for more to come as well That'll do it for this edition. Thanks to our sponsor, the Smart ETFs, Smart Transportation and Technology ETF. The ticker symbol for the ETF is MOTO, and more information is available at MOTOETF.com. We really want to thank Jay Rogers, CEO of Local Motors, for being with us this week. Great, great comments, great insight, Jay, and really appreciate you taking this time. Thanks, Fred. Thanks, Alan. It's been a pleasure. And thank you, Jay. Really great having you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Cheers. you. Cheers.
Cheers. You can find us at smartdrivingcar.com, also on Anchor FM, Spotify, TuneIn, Apple, Google, Spreaker, SoundCloud, and more. Wherever you get your podcasts, you can get your smart speaker to play us. And you can find my tech reports at textination.com. I'm Fred Fishkin, along with Alan Kornhauser. Thank you for listening or watching, and please stay safe.